shape-shifting homeless man. My friends and I get together every Friday. We watch movies, eat tacos, get drunk. It's fun times. Most of them live within reasonable walking distance of my house, and only two of them have cars, so they usually walk or bike home late at night. No dangerous incidents have occurred thus far. Yesterday, one of them got drunk and walked home. On his way home, he says he saw one of the familiar homeless men that live in the woods or abandoned buildings nearby. He said it was Treebeard, an enigmatic hobo that lives in the woods near the park. He has a big bushy beard, is rotund, and really tan. Maybe he's of Middle Eastern or Native American descent. He's not especially tall or large. He doesn't hold up signs or back. We honestly have no idea how he makes a living. Apparently, Treebeard was sitting on a bench in the park when a dog of some sort approached him. The dog stared at him for a while, and then Treebeard stood up and started walking with the dog. My friend swears that for a split second before Treebeard left his line of sight, he suddenly contorted his form. He became gaunt and limber, dropped down to all fours, and he and the dog began racing off into the woods. My friend freaked out and stumbled slash ran the rest of the way home. My friend told us about this on Facebook this morning, and he swears this could not have been a result of his intoxication. He claims he wasn't drunk enough. Of course, nobody believes him, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of my doubt, since this isn't the first time someone has reported seeing something strange that involved Treebeard. My cousin is terrified of this man. He claims that when he was a child playing in the park, he saw Treebeard leap six or eight feet off the ground and snatch a low-flying bird out of the air with his mouth. The other homeless men in the area, some of whom are themselves seemingly dangerous drug addicts, give Treebeard a wide berth. They seem worried by his presence. The woods in the park where Treebeard lives have a strict no camping, no overnight stay, and no squatting policy. And yet, as far as I can tell, Treebeard is just allowed to remain there. Treebeard doesn't own any pets or anything, but he's frequently seen with dogs, cats, and in one case, a coyote. He just kind of sits with them for a while. Some people claim that he talks to them, quietly muttering or whispering while they sit together, but those people are usually horrible gossips who probably just want to make him seem crazy. My aunt claims that my family is actually distantly related to Treebeard, although I was never told how and my parents deny it. She went on to claim that Treebeard had anxiety or social problems, which escalated until he just gave up his life, walked into the woods, and became a hobo hermit. If she's telling the truth, his real name is Alan, but no one seems to call him that. Despite these claims, he's reasonably friendly, especially for a scary homeless person. He doesn't seem unstable or dangerous. People occasionally converse with him, and he is always civil and polite, if occasionally unintelligible. What do you guys think about this? Should I talk to Treebeard about this incident? Are there any more stories of Treebeard? Deeply interested in this. A few, but I personally have never experienced anything paranormal or supernatural, let alone things specifically involving Treebeard. All the stories are hearsay, and don't really have any evidence to back them up, so it's hard to tell which, if any, have truth to them. A woman called the police on Treebeard once, claiming he was acting in a threatening manner towards her while she was sitting at a bus stop. The police sent someone, but when they arrived on the scene, he was gone. The woman claimed that he had been sitting across the street, smiling wildly with a wild look in his eyes, making gruff noises. She yelled at him to stop, and he responded by barking aggressively at her. That's when she called the police. She says he wandered into an alley nearby. The police went to check for him, but all they found was a stray dog. He went missing for about two weeks when I was still in high school. Neither I or my friend saw him during the duration of that time. It was the only time he'd ever done that. We assumed he had moved on, or died, or he was just spending all of his time in his woodland home, but showed up again, fine as he can be. I wanted to ask him where he'd been, but decided it was none of my business. Okay, so I think I may have fucked up with Treebeard. 
I don't think I'm in any danger or anything, since Treebeard doesn't seem dangerous at all, but I think I might have made him mad. I'm going to type the whole story out, and then post it all back to back. It'll probably take a few minutes. Alright, here we go. Got curious. So this afternoon, in broad daylight, I took a walk around town, and went to the areas Treebeard typically visits, with the intent of talking to him. He wasn't sitting down by any streets, or looking in any alleys, so I decided to check out the park. He was there. I approached him, as friendly as I can be. I knew it would be kind of weird to just walk up and say, Hey, me and my friends have been watching you since we were kids, and one of them says you can shapeshift into a big dog. Haha, <laughs> is that true? So I decided to ask him about my friend's dog. My friend has a dog. It went missing about a week ago. It was a rescue pit bull slash mutt, and it was a nice dog, but it's dumb as hell. He left it outside one night because it pissed in the house, and it got out. It hasn't been found by anyone yet, as far as he can tell, and he just now started putting up posters looking for the thing. Pick related, it's what the dog looked like. Anyway, that was my icebreaker. I walked up to Treebeard, who was sitting on a park bench, staring intently at some ducks. Hey, excuse me, I said. I asked him if he had seen a dog recently. He turned his whole body towards me, shifting on the bench without moving his neck and then stared for a somewhat uncomfortable period of time. He said I look familiar. Well, I've lived here all my life, I explained, and that I've seen him around town before too. He stared for a little while, then asked what kind of dog I was looking for and why. I described the dog to him, and he sat there and nodded the whole time, looking me in my eyes through his thick facial hair and old baseball cap. He raised his finger as I described the dog, and how it had gone missing, and just said, totally calmly, what is your name? I tell him I'm Anon, and ask him for his. Nice to meet you Anon, I am Alan. He says, A-L-L-E-N, Alan, not L-A-N, Alan. I must have widened my eyes or something, because he squinted, and asked if something was wrong. I said no, it's just that my aunt said, she thought you were named something like that once, when we saw you together. He raised his eyebrow and said something along the lines of, Is that right? I told him I didn't know and tried to move on, but he raised his finger again to interrupt me and ask my last name. I didn't really see the harm in telling him, so I did. He sat there and thought for a minute, then asked me if I knew my great-grandfather. Well, he didn't ask if I knew my great-grandfather. He asked if I knew, insert great-grandpa's name here. I told him I did that he was my grand-grandpa, and he started laughing again. Apparently, when my great-grandpa died, Alan, slash Treebeard's father, was also a widower, and he had married my great-grandma. So we are kind of related, I guess, if only by marriage. So, I laughed with him, did the generic, that's so weird body language, with the white stands, and hands on my hips and shit. So I got back to talking about the dog, and when I was done, he nodded a little and then said he'd keep an eye out for it. I said thanks and reached out my hand. He flinched a little, which made me flinch a little. We stared for a minute, then he chuckled real slightly and shook my hand. I told him he seemed like a really great guy, that I was sorry I'd never talked to him before. He said he didn't blame me and that he understood that homeless people can be kind of frightening, especially an old guy like him. That's when I saw my opportunity and I took it. Yeah, I said. I've heard some weird stories from people around town. Just a bunch of BS, I'm sure. He looked back towards the lake, then back up at me. What kind of stuff, he asked. He seemed kind of tense, and even if he wasn't dangerous, I didn't want to bother him or make him sad, so I kind of regretted pointing it out, but it was too late to go back now. I laughed a little, to try to smooth the air, then said, My cousin's convinced that you have superhuman strength, and eat seagulls to sustain yourself. He stared for a minute, then started giggling. Not chuckling, or laughing, or chortling, or anything. It was giggling. The way a little kid does. He was really amused, and I guess it was kind of funny, so he started laughing too. Well, I can tell you that ain't true, he said. I say I know. I figure it wasn't, but that there was just this kind of urban myth or whatever about him. He laughed more. I laughed too. He asked what else people thought. Well, one guy I talked to sometimes 
says he was walking home one night and watched she turn into a wolf or something, I say, and laugh for a second. Then Treebeard slash Helen stopped laughing and just kind of stared at me. I choked on my laugh and gulped. A wolf? he asked, looking completely sincere. Yeah, I said. He just kept staring at me, really intensely, kind of frighteningly, and in that silence, I realized that there was a big storm picking up. I realized that was probably a good excuse, so I told him, you know, I should probably get going, it's gonna storm soon. He just looked away, into the woods, and sat there for a minute. Then he mumbled something that sounded like, something something a wolf, something something dog. He seemed tense and bothered, and maybe even a little pissed. I excused myself, and told him I hoped he got somewhere dry before the storm, trying to sound as little like a jackass as I can. Then, I turned and started to walk away. Hey Anon, I heard from behind me, and I turned around really fast. Alan slash Treebeard is standing next to a park bench, and he's staring at me as the wind starts to pick up. Are you sure your friend said wolf, he asks. Honestly, he didn't, so I answer, no. Come to think of it, he said it was more like a dog or coyote, and I shit you not, he smiled. It wasn't an, oh that's so funny smile, or an angry smile, or a crazy smile, or anything like that. That smile was pure relief. All right, thanks, he said. It was nice talking to me, and I say the same thing back, and then I walk home. The whole way home, I rationalize things away, then contradict or counter myself, and have a whole big argument in my head about whether or not Alan the Treebeard is a shapeshifter. The storm really picked up, so I ended up hurrying home. The whole way home, I occasionally get the feeling that I'm being followed. When I look over my shoulder, no one is there, so I assume it's just paranoia. The storm is raging outside, so I can't really make out much of anything, but it looks like, down the street from my house, sitting under an illuminated bus stop, there is a big fucking dog, sitting there, staring down the street, right at my house. I'm gonna try to get a picture or something, but they all keep coming out black as hell, or too blurry to use, and I don't want to go out in the rain. All my doors are locked, windows too. I don't think he'd hurt me if he is that dog. He doesn't seem violent, but I do feel weirdly frightened by the dog. There's something eerie about it. There's everything eerie about it. Update. The dog is no longer visible. Possibly gone completely. Storm is still coming down really hard. Dog is back. Didn't see it arrive, but it's back in the same position. Tried to get a picture but it just comes out blurry and black. No, you don't understand. The dog is standing in a halo of light. There are street lamps and shit on my street. I have shined flashlights and had flash on while taking a picture. It doesn't matter. The picture is pitch black. I think I found a fake town last year. Like, Truman Show fake. Be me, last summer. Cross-country road trip hitting up some natural parks for out, in central southern Utah. It's getting late, like 10pm, been driving since about 6. It's dark as fuck, no moon, can only see what's lit up by my headlights. Decide to find some place to rest for the night at next exit. See a town off in the distance. Turn off on only pull-off I've seen for over an hour, heading towards town. Pull-off is unmarked and unlit. Not on car GPS. No cell service. Town is directly ahead though. Keep going. Road turns to dirt road, and is about five miles, until it turns to pavement again, right at the town where businesses and houses started showing up. Immediately, town strikes me as weird. Nobody is on the streets. No cars on the streets, or in the businesses' parking lots. Jazz music is being pumped through the streets for some reason. Not loudly but loud enough to hear. This town that looked to be about seven blocks wide from some miles out has every major fast food chain I've heard of and seven hotels on the main street. Still no cell service. Still not on car GPS. Go to get food. KFC was fully illuminated and unlocked. Nobody there. Same thing with Jack in the Box. 
McDonald's has a cashier and cook when I go there. Both look annoyed. Take my order. Give me distinctly non-McDonald's nuggets and fries. Leave. Start going to get a bed for the night. Hampton Inn. Empty parking lot. Furred, annoyed-looking person informs me they're all booked up. La Quinta. Person I'm now convinced was the cook at McDonald's is behind the check-in counter. Also empty parking lot. Also fully booked. Holiday Inn Express. Empty parking lot. Person that was clearly the fucking cashier at McDonald's is behind the check-in counter. Surprisingly, they have rooms. I ask him if he's the guy from McDonald's. Uh, no, that's my brother. Fuck it. Good enough for me. Get to room. Wi-Fi exists, but nothing loads. Shower. Crash. Wake up next day. No breakfast in lobby. No other guests. McDonald's guy still there for checkout. Ask him how to get out of town. Same road you came in on. Head to McDonald's to get something to eat. Town is still playing smooth jazz. Still nobody on the street. Order at drive through drive through lady is definitely lady from the Hampton Inn. Ordered a fucking McGriddle and black coffee. She hands me a microwave English muffin sandwich and what I assume to be some kind of instant coffee. Place is too fucking weird to stay and argue. Heading down the only fucking road in and out of town. Maybe three miles under the five mile dirt road. Notice big metal wire fence on both sides of the road in the desert. Meet on the road in a big motorized gate that is open. Soon as I pass through, gate starts closing. Get back onto road. Finally get onto 62. That's not right. I could have sworn I was on 89 when I decided to pull off and there's mountains in between. Finally get cell service. Nothing matches description of town. None of the charges ever show up on my card. I've told some people and one suggested it was Richfield, but I know I was south of there and you know, they would have actually charged me for stuff. This is something my great-grandpa told me about his time in service during World War II. Great-grandpa, native Swede, was serving with the Finns during World War II, right on the border to Russia. Often get sent out on scouting missions and such. Once, during such a mission, he and his squad get into a firefight with what they assumed was Russian scouts. Firefight goes on a while until they get hit by a freak snowstorm. Deepest winter on the Russo-Finn border is more or less Ragnarok on its own. Add a snowstorm to that, and yeah, you get the picture. Great-grandpa and his men take this opportunity to bail, and do so successfully, but end up getting lost in the process. According to him, it felt like they were walking for hours, until finally they saw faint lights in the dark, in raging weather. Their relief wasn't long lived though, when the figure that approached them from the light aimed his rifle at them and ordered them, in what great-grandpa always described as exceptionally slowed Russian, to drop their weapons and surrender. Great-grandpa and his squad did so, considering they were tired and almost out of ammo anyway. Another Russian takes their shit, and two more fellas lead them at gunpoint through their camp. Camp consisted of about two dozen snow-covered tents, some haphazardly made palisade, and a couple of fading campfires. There were people huddled closely around all of the fires, all draped in thick grey wool coats and blankets, and the few that weren't by a fire were standing in the dark edges of camp, keeping watch. Finally, they reach the bigger fire in camp, and are told to sit and shut up, while one of the guards put handcuffs and manacles on them and lock them. After this is done, the Russian who captured them looks at my great-grandpa and points to a man sitting opposite of him and says, This is Strelnik. Never sure about how the name was written. Strelnik never sleeps, and he never blinks, so don't do anything stupid. Sure enough, underneath the thick blanket, coat, and slightly obscured by the rim of his helmet, great-grandpa could make out the fire reflecting off the men's eyes. While the storm raged on in the background, great-grandpa silently tried to stay awake, but after the day he'd had, he couldn't, and finally fell asleep. That morning, he is awakened by one of his squadmates, frantically rustling his chains, trying to get them off. 
he shoots a glance at Strelnik, who's still staring coldly at him. Squadmate, who's still trying to get the chains off, suddenly shouts, Never mind them, they're all dead, just help me. After they get the chains off, they investigate, and sure enough, every single Russian in that camp was dead, including two of Great Grandpa's men, who froze to death during the night. They, and the four guards that arrested them, were the only ones even remotely fresh. The rest were ice pops, as Great Grandpa put it. After that, it's nothing interesting. They managed to get back to their post and report their night. Apparently, they had managed to wander way off into Russian territory during the snowstorm. My great-grandpa was a rock of a man. Nothing fazed him except snow and the crackling of fire after that. When he'd come over and visit, we would have to put out our fireplace, otherwise he wouldn't come inside, and whenever it started snowing, he'd pull down his blinds and cry quietly. Lizard People in the Caves A Nevada woman and her son receive a nighttime visitor, an apparent lizard man that seemed to be searching for an item that the teen had stolen from its cave lair. The following account was recently forwarded to me. In 1977, a woman in Henderson, Nevada, C.H., claimed that her 13-year-old son and friends had gone out to explore in the area of Black Mountain, which has many scattered abandoned mines and caves. They hiked out across the desert landscape and climbed the foothills of the mountain until he found a cave. The narrow entrance forced them to crawl on their stomachs, using their pocket flashlights to chase back the oppressive darkness within, and they eventually came to a circular room about nine feet across. There they found a pit in the ground, which had a crude ladder. As they explored the room, they heard what sounded like voices and the far-off humming of some sort of machinery. Looking around further, they apparently came across a rusty metal door, deeper in an adjacent tunnel with a rod of some sort lying nearby, which seemed to be made of some kind of aluminum-like material and with engravings on the side. As they examined the rod and the strange doorway, they heard guttural voices approaching and decided to hurry to the entrance from which they had come, taking the bizarre rod with them. As they approached the entrance, they then heard what sounded like the door they had seen creaking open, after which there was an ominous growl, as a greenish humanoid creature began to emerge from the cave. The boys then turned and ran as fast as they could from this place, later telling C.H. about the strange incident and showing her the rod they had found. It seems the lizard man creature apparently wanted it back. That evening, as the boys slept, something very strange happened. C.H. would recount the sequence of surreal events. It must have been around two in the morning when my son shook me, whispering harshly that someone was trying to get into his bedroom window. I hoped it was just a nightmare, or his nerves were still on edge. Quietly, we slipped into his bedroom and listened to the sounds of scraping at the window edge. He was not mistaken. In the light of the moon, I could make out the silhouette head and shoulders of a man. I was alone with my four kids, no husband to protect us, so I grabbed my flashlight, suddenly tossed the curtains open to face the man. There was a glare from the flashlight on the window, but past the glare, I could clearly see a large head with ridges on the top, other ridges on his cheekbones, and the glow of golden eyes. My son and I stood still, unmoving, both fear and shock kept us frozen. The lizard man did not move either, his hand still poised in his attempt to pry the window open. His hand was large, with webbed, rough, gnarly looking fingers, with powerful claws. After a couple of minutes, not seconds, but long agonized minutes, with our hearts pounding, I knew I had to do something. One hand still holding the flashlight beam on his face, and my eyes still locked into those golden eyes. I fumbled around in the dark with my other hand, hoping to find something to use as a weapon. He glanced at my hand, looked back into my eyes. He turned his head a little, as if he was asking a question. He slightly opened his lipless mouth, displaying four of his pointed teeth, and suddenly he turned and ran off into the desert. She would later surmise that the bizarre creature had come for its rod, 
and so she and her husband and son decided they would return it to the cave in order to avoid another encounter. They hiked all the way out to the area where the boys said they found it and put the object by the cave entrance. According to the report, they just left it there and headed back, and there is no further mention of what happened after that, or if the irate lizard man came for them again or not. I'd like to share something that was once told to me by an associate. We both live in a big square state in the west, and this conversation came as we discussed the poor state of affairs in small middle American towns. No jobs, outsourcing, low farm wages, etc. He mentions that the world is smaller than it used to be. You can't travel sideways anymore. He's really into family genealogy and begins telling me some of the things he learned researching his family. Standard German immigrants. No spooky cults or fish people here. A lot of them work at towns that aren't on any maps. I think he means ghost towns. No, he explains. Not ghost towns. Not hidden towns. Towns you can only get to if you know how to get to them. Then how the hell do you find them in the first place? By accident, by driving, or riding, without really paying any attention to where you're going. Nothing really unnatural about those places. You could find work, buy goods, fill your tank, but there were small differences. Plains people don't really talk to out-of-towners. Even plains people from nowhere. You especially don't spend too much time discussing anything but weather and work with them. No one wants to talk about why there's someone else on their money and ours. Back when you could go to them for work, or they could come here, you knew them because they wouldn't take cash in payment, and you knew you were in one of their towns when you couldn't take theirs. We've got the wrong guy on our money for them, and they've got the wrong guy for us. They don't want to talk about it, and nobody who goes there wants to ask. Over time, people stop visiting them, and they stop coming. Told my granddad about it later. He kind of shrugged and said there wasn't anything off about it. Some people in really rural areas just kept strange customs, like the time a man he'd run into on a back roads had offered him bills with James K. Polk on them in exchange for some of his chickens. <laughs>